Hi guys and welcome to Project Diaries. Today I want to start off by saying sorry to anybody who's been waiting for me to do this video. Uh, unfortunately trolls and my own depression got the better of me so I decided not to release this one uh, months ago when I should have. But for some reason I'm getting loads of messages through and the view rate of my previous video, my mandatory reconsideration, is now going through the roof and that is now the top uh, viewed video for that uh, subject on YouTube. So there's definitely something going on within the government for people to want uh, want me to carry on doing this video. So I'm going against all the haters and I'm still going to do this because I think it's really important and it seems to be helping hundreds of people. So today I want to talk you through the tribunal system. Now this will also include ESA and PIP, personal independence payments. It's virtually the same tribunal uh, but there are a couple of differences. Uh, so I'm going to talk you through those today because I've been through it twice now. Uh, but I will give you some information. There will be a timeline in the description box below if you want to skip to different sections because I will try and cover as much as I can today. But first off, I want to give you some updates on what's going on with Atos. Now, Atos is the company, uh, one of two companies that are in charge of doing these work capability assessments. And they've been accused of doing all sorts. Now, Atos and Capita secured a £500 million contract to do these assessments, but within a year, they were so far behind, over 100,000 claimants weren't getting their money or their assessments. This actually backfired and led to an investigation into both of these companies to find out why they were falling short. It turns out that they promised the government and the DWP that they had 740 outlets to do these assessments, which was a complete lie in their tender document. This is the contract for them to get these assessments. It turned out they only had 96 assessment sites, which is why they were falling short so quickly. The DWP were also accused of turning a blind eye and knowing about this system, but still paying them anyway. Between 2011 and 2014, nearly 2,500 people died because they lost their benefits. This meant they wasn't getting the carers that they need and they couldn't get the access to the hospitals or treatments that they needed either. With all this money coming out of taxpayers' pockets and going into privatised companies, this led to an investigation into the Tory party who were dragged through the court system themselves. They were taken to two different tribunals in the UK and one in the EU and all three of them found the Tory party guilty of violating human rights. So this basically means the government now need to go back and revisit 1.6 million cases and open the system up to people with mental health issues. So the difference between DLA and PIP are basically it, your old system was based on your, uh, your symptoms and your diagnosis. So if you had spinal bifida and you had uh, medical records to back that up, you then got the higher rate award. But PIP is based on how it affects you. So you can give them all the MRI scans, x-rays and everything else and the diagnosis of whatever your long-term illness is. But it's how it affects you. You can have uh, certain spine problems, walking problems. But they want to assess your day-by-day -day activities, whether it be cooking, cleaning, washing yourself, uh, cl uh, clothing yourself and things like that. So it's a slightly different system. Because of millions of people were losing their benefits and it was taking over a year for them to get these tribunal dates, this added so much stress, anxiety and frustration towards disabled people, causing over 80% of disabled people to have worse symptoms from when they first started. Now if you've been following my channel closely, you'll notice a huge decline in my health as well. This is mainly due to this system. Now a lot of people have been waiting a year for their tribunal dates. I had to wait 17 months but finally it came through and I've went through it. So today I'm gonna to talk you through how to go through an ESA or a PIP tribunal service. And here's how you have to do it. Now today's video is advice on the first tier tribunal system. If you fail this, you can go on to a second tier tribunal, but if you, if you failed at this point, it's probably because you haven't got enough medical evidence. Uh, and it's gonna be very difficult to fight it again after this point. But today I'm gonna to talk you through the first tier. Now, if you haven't gone through your mandatory reconsideration section yet, I definitely suggest checking out this video first, watch that and then come back to this because you have to go through the tribunal system after you've done that video. Now, at this point, you've basically been completely ignored by the DWP, Atos and the assessor that you've had for about 10 minutes, uh, who wasn't really qualified, who was a healthcare professional, didn't know much about your disability and you've probably uh, been given the wrong kind of quotes or the wrong assessment. For me, I had a paralysed left leg. I was given zero points when I was on previous DLA higher rate 
and basically told that I was just fit for work and just I didn't qualify for anything. So I've had to drag them all the way through the courts to go to the tribunal system. Now, tribunals aren't like courts at all. Now in a court, you're usually put on a witness stand and there's different tier systems. The judge is usually higher and the lawyers are usually in the dock. Nothing like that at all. Now court system, you would have to get your own lawyer and you would usually go up against the judge and some witnesses and it's a quite a, a tough system. Now if you've seen my health video, you know I went through the court system when I was attacked uh, and was brutally beaten up uh, by five different people. It's not like that at all. The court system is really intimidating uh, and it can be quite anxiety driven. But the tribunal is a lot more laid back and it's done in an office building or somewhere a little bit more chilled out. So please don't worry about that. So what is a tribunal? It's basically an independent decision maker that's gonna go through all of your medical records to find out if you have a case and to see if Atos, Capita or the DWP have made any mistakes and to come to their own conclusion on whether you're eligible for these disability benefits. Now, if you're going through an ESA tribunal, you will only probably have two people. Now that would be the judge and a doctor. If you're going through the PIP tribunal, you will have three, maybe four people. Like I said, that would be the judge, the doctor, and somebody who's uh, either disabled or a carer. You're usually sat opposite the, the three members of the tribunal service, and it's just laid back, so please, please don't let that be a worry to you. You may also have, and they, they told me it was rare, somebody from the DWP to come in and sit in. Now, if this is rare, I had it on both times, so I must have just been really unlucky. But they're there not to really do anything, they're there to just over, oversee the whole tribunal service. Now once you've sat down in the office, they will address you uh, to whichever name you, you ask for, and they will say the same. So you don't need to address the judge as your honour or sir or anything like that. They will, they will say the names that they want you to address them by. So that's also quite a nice laid back uh, system as well. Now, as I said before, these tribunal systems are completely free. You don't have to pay for your own legal aid or lawyers. And it is costing the taxpayers a million pound a week to go through these tribunals to try and fix what these companies have done wrong. Now, as I said in my previous video, there are advocacy services that you can use, which allows somebody to come in who's been through the system before to kind of have your back and help you through the system. If you can't find an advocacy service, you are allowed to take one extra person now, even if that's just to reassure you and relax you a little bit, I definitely suggest you take in one person, even if it's a carer, a, a parent or a friend, somebody like that, you're allowed to take one person. So please definitely take that to reassure yourself to start with. Now, this is going to be the first time you can argue your case face to face with a human being. Up until this point, you've basically just been put on hold, given a decision and everything else has been done via, via telephone or via postage. So really use this to talk to somebody, talk to the judge, talk, talk to the doctor, assess your account, assess all of your medical records. Now there are a lot of backlash that I had when I did my health video uh, and people were saying, I really hope DWP sees this or the government sees this and calls you out. Well, it's the complete opposite. I actually made that video to go through my own health problems so I could remember what happens to me. And it basically, it worked for me, not against me. Because that allowed me to remember what happened to my health over the past few years and seeing the decline. Now basically they will only listen to what happened to you when you had your assess assessment and previous. If your uh, disability then declined after your assessment, you'll have to reapply and I'll talk to you about that later on. But as for me, this happened 17 months ago so they will only look at how bad I was at that particular date. So the first thing is knowing what to wear. Now, usually in a court, you'd have to go smart to try and impress the judge, but because this is based on your own disability, you, you should just go in whatever you wear day to day. Now, if you struggle getting dressed and need a carer, uh, it's, it's really, you know, sort of, just go in what is comfortable. You don't have to, this, they, the tribunal want to see a clear representation of what you're like and how you're like day by day. So if you go all smartly dressed and shaven and in a suit, then they're just gonna think you're fully, you're completely fine and you know that's gonna probably go against you. For me, I basically had an operation two days prior to my, um, my tribunal. 
So as I wasn't dressed in my regular attire, I did find it necessary to apologise to the tribunal about how I was dressed because there was no other way of me getting there. And to so I had to wear shorts and a t-shirt and a hoodie. So pretty much what I'm wearing today, I had to wear to a tribunal. So I couldn't wear trousers. So I felt uh, obligated just to apologise. And it's always good to get them on side anyway. But none of that basically is listened to in a tribunal. Like I say, they only go back to when the assessment was first taken. So quite frankly, that was really bad for me to turn up in a worse state. Also, if you're on lots of medication, try not to over overdo the medication to get yourself through that. Uh, assessment. The assessments can take quite a long time, anything between half an hour and, and an hour. So if you're really dosed up on lots of drugs, um, when I was there there was a guy that was really in, uh, alleviated on alcohol and quite hostile. Please try not to do too many too many painkillers, too many drugs, just to try and get yourself there and get through the system. If you're going to be in pain, they're going to want to see this. If you're having struggle, uh, if you're struggling walking and, and sitting and things like that, they're going to want to see this. So don't overdo, uh, overdo your uh, pharmaceutical drugs. So the things to take are definitely all of your documents. Now it's completely unnecessary, but every single medical uh, document that you send to the DWP, by law they then have to send a copy of it back. So at this point you should have two copies of your medical records. So take one of those to your tribunals. Uh, they will also page it in a numerical order uh, to how they received it. So for me there was over I think nearly 700 pages so they will number each page and basically before you go to the tribunal you want to refresh yourself through it, maybe highlight some of the some of the problems. For me they said that I had full working lower limbs and obviously my paralyzed left leg so I highlighted any documents that said about my leg, um, anything that from orthopedics uh, so basically you want to highlight any of the pages that you think are going to be really beneficial and give evidence for your case previously. So definitely do that and, and get it into your head what case you want to put forward to this tribunal. So when you're given your tribunal letter it will basically say that your tribunal will not be before a certain time. It won't give you a specific time because tribunals overrun all the time. So for mine was 10.30 in the morning, so it basically said that I would not be seen before 10.30, but it might necessarily mean you could be sitting around most of the day waiting for your slot. So make sure your entire day is free, and if your carer, somebody's coming with you, they're, they're available for a majority of that day as well. So when I arrived to my tribunal building, again, there was no disabled parking outside. We had to park quite far away. So again, I was in quite a lot of pain by the time I even got through the door. Thankfully, there was a sofa in the reception, which I used. We then checked in. They then allowed us to use the disabled lift, take us up to the first floor and uh, let us sit in the waiting room. Now they were running behind on that day so we were left there for about half an hour and the seats were really uncomfortable so again my back was playing up, my neck was playing up and my knees were hurting. Uh, also I, I couldn't really sit properly because of the operation that I had so that prolonged uh, my pain as well but we finally got through and was asked to go to the tribunal office which again was the office at the end of the corridor. Now while I was walking up the corridor, the person from the DWP actually witnessed me being in so much pain and struggling and helped me. He was such a nice lad. Uh, he must have been in his mid-20s. It was, it was a bit weird to, to see someone so young being in such an uh, authority uh, position, but it was really lovely for him to help me. So uh, I had to stop halfway through the corridor and I was in so much pain by the time we got there. By the time I sat down in the, uh, the tribunal office, we had to pause for a minute for me to just have a breather. They're completely relaxed. They want you to be sort of really at ease and they're quite lenient when it comes to you trying to settle and, and getting down to this tribunal system. So please don't let that be a worry either. So once the tribunal starts, they will basically analyze it in two different sections. Now the one, the first one will be uh, under data, so they will look under all of your medical records. And the second one will be credibility. They will assess you to see how credible it is according to what you've given as medical evidence. Now there could be a huge difference between credibility and lying. Now there could be a lot of people like me where exterior wise that I don't look that ill but interior wise uh, there's a lot going on with, with uh, 
my bone structures, uh, my joints with arthritis and things like that. So the, it's up to the, the uh, tribunal to assess your own credibility and to try and find out that if you're lying. So if you have things like uh, fibromyalgia and things like that, it's really hard to assess externally how bad that your system really is. So again, this is uh, up to you to really try and find the evidence to uh, present to the tribunal. And at this point, they've all they've had every single uh, copy of your medical uh, information and they know pretty much everything about you as well. So they will go through your case like a fine tooth comb. And again, if you're lying, it's quite easy to put on a limp or fake a back problem. But, you know, if you haven't got the medical records to prove that, then it, it's quite easy for the tribunal to go through that. For me, I could barely walk on that day. So it, that also went against me because my system was worse to how I was assessed. So everybody that was telling me to go and get a job and stop faking it, you know, whatever. Don't care about trolls, but moving on. Now another thing is, is that these people have to pry into your personal life and you have to be really open with them. Now this could be really hard. This could cause anxiety, stress, frustration, and just make you feel bad. Me assessing my disability over the years uh, really took a toll on me mentally. Uh, it was very hard for me to, to see what I've been struggling with because I'm such a positive person all the time. I only ever see what I, I can achieve, not what I'm not achieving. So the tribunal will go through everything that, that is negative in your life rather than a positive thing. So it can have a bad effect. But you're going to have to let them do this and they will go through it really badly. And that's why I suggest taking somebody to your tribunal with you to give you that emotional support. So another tricky thing is, is because this assessment took 17 months, I've kind of got to go back in time and just think about how I was then. Because anything that's wrong with me now is irrelevant. So it's really, really difficult for you to get into that mind space, especially if you've got a debilitating illness, uh, you know, sort of Parkinson's, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, cancer, anything like that. Your system's going to get worse and worse over time. So it's going to be really hard for you to go back to nearly sort of 15, 17 months, which again is another obstacle to get into. So it's imperative that you go through your medical history and try and get it in your head before you even enter this office. So one of the first questions the tribunal asked me was, how am I now in comparison to how I was when I was first assessed? Now obviously I was fresh out of hospital, so I was in a lot worse state than I, uh, I was previously. Uh, so I explained that to them and they just wrote that down on a note. Uh, so usually it's beneficial for you to be the same as what, uh, when you were first assessed. But if you're a debilitating illness and it's got worse, just be open and honest with them at all points. Just be yourself and try not to over exaggerate anything. Just be 100% real and honest. So I also had to explain that the fact that uh, even though I'd just come out of hospital, I was still using crutches on my assessment. I still struggled to get to the assessor's office uh, and I was still having problems with my knee, legs, back, neck and etc. So even though my situation had worsened and my pain had got worse, I'd still struggled to get to my original assessment. So that's where the, the parallels were even. So another question the tribunal will ask you is what your typical day is. Now with my disability, there is no such thing as a typical day. One day I could wake up feeling sort of almost pain free, be really active and motivated as I do these Project Diaries videos on good days. And then other days I could be bed bound for two, three days and not be able to move and barely eat and things like that. So it was really hard for me to give an honest opinion and an honest what my regular day is because it fluctuates so much so with people with uh, my kind of disabilities it's very hard to give that that honest uh, honest day so i just gave them what i was like on that day and i basically said that i i had virtually no sleep i had str uh, struggled walking uh, that if it's raining and the weather's cold it affects my knee joints and my arthritis uh, I'm a lot better in the summer with heat and things like that. So I just gave them the, the answer and the best answer that I, th I thought possible. Other things is sometimes I can drive, like going to granddad's, and other days I'm bed bound or I have to rely on my parents and friends to take me to hospital visits. So it, it really does fluctuate, so it's hard to give this answer. Now this is where it starts to get a little bit more uncomfortable. The, uh, the GP or the doctor then started asking me lots more personal questions and diving into my medical history. 
uh, especially about the distance that I can walk and about my arthritis, uh, and my spinal bifida and things like that. And it started to make me feel quite uncomfortable. Uh, he was then asking me about my heart condition uh, and then I basically said that I still hadn't seen uh, a spine specialist. It's taken me nearly four years to see anybody, that the orthopedics were um, a big problem with the shoes, etc. And I still hadn't properly seen a cardiologist even though my results came back with uh, all my heart problems. Um, he then referred to uh, the cardiologist report saying that it was fine and it was anxiety. I then uh, argued with the GP and basically said it wasn't anxiety at all and that the scan came back uh, that I had the, the, the heart problems that I've had previously. He then became argumentative at the fact that the cardiologist made a bad report and I basically said, well, yes, he did. It wasn't about anxiety at all. The anxiety was caused by this PIP system and how long they left me uh, and it had nothing to do with my heart at all. Um, so he basically, the, the doctor basically said, so are you saying that doctors are filing false reports? Uh, to which I then presented seven other false reports that other doctors have done over uh, the past previous years and then presented the fake report that the assessor did by basically saying that my lower limbs were fully functional when I had a paralyzed left leg. So his argument actually went against his case or against the case and I came out on top on that argument because I then proved that a lot of my doctors have failed to report a lot of my systems even though they were contradictory to some of the scans and other doctors that I've seen. So I was really happy with that. Now I won't go into it too much because that uh, the system will change quite a lot and different, uh, different questions will uh, result in different answers. But I was then passed on to the person. Now she didn't state whether she was disabled or uh, a carer and I feel like I should have asked that. I'm not sure whether I would, would be allowed but I think I would have been a little bit more reassured knowing if she was disabled or if she was the carer. But she then started hounding me with these questions and it felt like she had an agenda. She started asking me, uh, obviously when I went to Thailand I had to have uh, lots of vaccinations. Uh, so she asked me about how I go on holiday, how I use the toilet on a plane. Uh, and obviously I, I was saying that uh, I can use the seats to, to walk down or I, I try to find a seat that's close to the toilets. And plane toilets are a lot easier because there's loads of handheld um, handrails and it's a lot more stability so I couldn't understand her point. Now I usually go to Florida over the winter months because the cold and damp weather really plays up with my arthritis and it's just lovely to go and see my friends in America uh, and big shout out to all my subscribers over there as well. Uh, but over the past year or so I've been un even unable to do that because my health has declined so much over the, this process that I can't even take long car journeys uh, so I wouldn't even make it to the airport right now. They then asked me how I get on the plane and if I take the stairs and uh, how I find going on holiday. And I've always said that the uh, wheelchair assist at Gatwick are absolutely amazing. And, uh, and again, the, the, uh, the doctors and the uh, tribunal uh, really didn't seem to believe me at the fact it's a lot easier for me to get to Florida than it is to get to my hospitals in London. I need to get on the platforms, uh, I need to go on the London Underground, going up and down stairs, it's really painful on my back. And now that the rail companies have changed the seats, just even an hour on a train is really uncomfortable. Uh, with Florida, I can just stay on a level playing field. They can pick me up in a wheelchair at Gatwick. They can get me on the plane. The seats are really comfortable. And at the other end, they pick me up in a wheelchair and take me to my friend's car. It's so simple. Uh, I can get to America a lot quicker. But with, uh, or a lot easier, sorry. But they didn't seem to believe me on that one. But leave a comment in the description box below and let me know if you have the same problem. So she kept hounding me and hounding me and hounding me to a point where I basically just asked her to, to hold her hostility uh, because it was causing my anxiety to skyrocket and I really didn't appreciate the way that she was uh, talking down at me and just basically being so, so hostile. But because these questions were then related all the way back to sort of 2006, 2009 and then she kept asking me about the present day I was getting really angry because none of this had any relevance to the case. It, your case is based on the date that you had your assessment and how bad you were on the day of your assessment. So she was bringing up all of these problems and really, really going at me, which I then started having a, an anxiety attack, which then led my heart to have lots of problems. 
I was then in lots and lots of chest pains and I had breathing problems, I went really dizzy and they were gonna pull the, the tribunal. To a, a, At that point, I was pleading, just give me five minutes, all I need is her to, to stop talking to me, stop being so hostile, and just to let me calm down. So I focused on my breathing, and I just chilled myself out, and they allowed me to have 10 minutes to myself. They had a little recess, and I, I came back, and, and then they started questioning me again. But I found that really out of order, and I, don't, I thought that, out of anybody in that tribunal system, the person with a disability or, or the person who worked with a disability uh, ability or cares for someone may be a little bit more empathetic and not so hostile. But that was the system that I had. Hopefully you won't have the same. I then asked the judge to intervene because her questioning was so irrelevant. It had nothing to do with the case or nothing to do with how I was. My, my health has de declined over the years and got worse. So while she was going back to days that I was a little bit more healthy and a little bit more active, I had no idea. It just it felt like she was just trying to rattle me and and cause cause me to have anxiety, which she she was really successful in. After I got over my anxiety attack, I kindly asked the judge, "Can we stop asking me moot points and questions that are irrelevant to this case and get down to the nitty-gritty because I've been here for 17 months?" and this questioning isn't leading to anywhere that is evidential to my case. To which he then gave me a certain look and then started questioning me according to the time, the to uh, the time that my assessment was uh, taken from. They then asked me about going shopping, if I go to uh, supermarkets, if I go and buy clothes and things like that. Uh, I then said that if I go to the supermarket, I usually use uh, one of their electric wheelchairs or I find uh, pushing one of the lighter trolleys like a Zimmer frame so I can take the weight off my back and just use my right leg to get around. Uh, so it's a lot easier than using my crutches like I usually use. Uh, and they, they seem quite happy with that answer. So they then started asking me about uh, how I get around my house, if I take stairs, um, how I get in the bath, how I use the toilet, uh, how I use handrails and things like that. Uh, so that got a bit personal again. Um, I, I now live with my parents, uh, so obviously there's no handrails or adjustments or disability things that I need there. And I do actually struggle to, uh, to get in the shower and the bath and use the toilet and, and just things like that on a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day system. And they seem to really be taken back by the fact that we haven't installed any handrails and things like that. We've got two natural handrails going up to up the stairs to my bedroom, uh, which are handy. But you know, they they were really seem to be taken back that none of the bathroom had been converted, that we didn't have a walk-in shower. Now, obviously, it's not my long-term uh, idea to to stay with my parents because of my age. I want to be independent again and and, and live by myself. So I'm not going to expect my parents to have these kind of aids put into their house and things like that. But they didn't seem to really take that on board. They seemed to be quite shocked, but it was that kind of answer and I gave it a fair. Now at this point, the tribunal then turned around and said, do I have any final words to say? At this point, I then looked round to my mum and asked her to leave the room. Uh, when she closed the door behind her, I then uh, faced the man from DWP and because I've done my research before, I then said to him, I know the DWP don't keep anything like this on record, but I'd like it to go on the record for this tribunal that prior to me uh, going through this system from uh, DLA to PIP, my, my life was complicated, but I was managing my pain and my symptoms quite well, and I was motivated most of the time, and I only, only had a few days that were bad out of the month. Since going over to PIP, I now have more bad days than good. Uh, I wasn't on any medication previously, but I'm now on 17 different medications all of which seem to have side effects, uh, so I need to take more pills to counteract those side effects. Uh, it's caused me to have loads of mental health problems. Uh, I've had a nervous breakdown, a heart attack, and I even became suicidal at one point. Um, so this system is really hard, um, and that was before I was, I was completely fine. So I can really empathise with people with mental health issues uh, and long-term illnesses that, that are... Um, that are just a little bit tougher than what I've had. I was a really strong-minded person and this system still broke me. 
And the only reason why I said this is because I felt completely defeated after this entire process anyway. I really felt like the, the lady that was um, really hostile and, and, and quite talking down at me, it felt like she already she already made up her mind. The, the doctor seemed to, uh, to disbelieve the fact that I had so many uh, different uh, wrongful doctor reports, even though I had that as evidence. And the judge seemed to be on the fence, so I didn't feel like I had anything to lose, so I just wanted to get that off my, my chest just to make myself feel better. Now, obviously, my state of mind is a lot better now, and I'm not in that situation anymore. Uh, my mental health is really improving. Um, I'm trying to come off a lot of the medications, uh, so I am in a, a better place emotionally uh, but physically I'm in more pain than I've ever been and I'm now reliant on parents and friends to do a lot for me so this system is is making people sick. So at this point the tribunal is over they asked you to go back to the waiting room so I had to go all the way back down the corridor again uh, I waited in a different uh, waiting room this time and for some reason they had the air conditioning on maximum so again the cold air really affected my joints my neck my knee uh, now decisions usually take around 10 minutes so I'm told but they took over 45 minutes to come to a decision and because of my heart condition and I felt like I couldn't uh, take any more I did plead with them to give me a decision on the day. Now this isn't uh, necessarily going to happen to you, they might uh, go back and write letters to you but if you can ask them to give you a decision on the day because it just prolongs it even more for people, people like me. Um, so basically we waited 45 minutes, I was in absolutely agony, we had no way of turning the air conditioning off. Uh, the guy from the DWP then asked me to go back to the office, so I had to walk all the way back up the corridor again, to which I really, really struggled at this point. The young lad helped me again, uh, and when I got into the office they said, no need to sit down, and I basically just said, no, I need to sit down, I'm in so much pain right now. So they allowed me to uh, take a seat and get my breath back, uh, to which they then talked me through how the system was work working and how many points they were giving me. Now, it's based on uh, the distance you can walk. This is the mobility system. So it's based on dis distance, whether you use walking aids, and uh, how you can plan a route. So the first question on distance, you can pretty much get a maximum of 10 points. Now, to my delight, they gave me these full maximum 10 points. Now, to get a standard rate, you need between 8 and 11 points. So that gave me the standard rate uh, PIP award. Now, to get the other two points, to get maximum higher rate, which I was on DLA, I didn't get anything because the government has now manipulated the system to incorporate people with mental illness. So the other question is, can you plan a route? Now obviously I can go on a computer or my phone and I can go onto Google Maps and type in uh, different um, zip codes or postcodes and I can follow that route because that's cognitive. It has nothing to do with physical ability. But because I, could, I couldn't get these last two points, it means that no matter how bad I am at walking, whether I need uh, a wheelchair or crutches and things like that, my maximum points were 10, so I can only qualify for my standard rate. So this is a bit of a slap in the face because uh, I think right now it's only £22.60 or 65 a week. So it's a significant difference to getting a higher rate. And with a higher rate, it's not just about the money. If you're on a higher rate, you can claim uh, the motability scheme, which means you can get a, a car, you can get road free road tax, uh, there's so many different things, I'll put it on the screen now, of, of what happens if you get that higher rate. But now it feels like the government have lost this court thing and, and really manipulated this system to incorporate people with mental illnesses. But it's also made it really difficult for people with physical disabilities to gain these higher rates. Now another big difference between the DLA and PIP is that the DLA was for life. Because it's a debilitating illness that I have, I will get worse over time. Uh, they they don't see the need to assess me anymore. But because of PIP is now run by these privatised companies that are earning millions, I've now only been awarded a two year award, which means I now need to go through this again in two years from scratch because there's nothing kept on the uh, DWP records. Uh, so I basically have to apply as a, a new client. But because I've been doing this for 17 months, I've only been awarded for two years, I now need to do this in a couple of months. It's an absolute joke and it's a disgusting system for people that have debilitating illnesses and disabilities. 
the stress, anxiety and depression that this system causes is causing people to have mental health issues that didn't previously have any problems. My problems were just physical, but it caused me to have a mental breakdown and serious depression, and it's absolutely disgusting. So if you feel like you've had this same problem, please leave a comment below because I'd love to hear how you got on. Uh, because I just think this system is so unjust, it's so biased, and it's really aimed to make people fail just so the government can save money on the sick, disabled, elderly, and, and people that really, really need it. This is quite disgusting. And on a side note, just because the DWP is still earning millions in bonuses, even though this system is completely flawed and they're still turning a blind eye to all these privatised companies, they won't leave you out because you'll get a £10 bonus every year. So the 17 months it's taken me to go over from DLA to PIP, I've pretty much been unable to work for the past year. I've not been able to drive since July. My parents are now allowing me to live at theirs uh, rent free. I've virtually been unable to pay any of my bills, I've racked up huge debts on my credit cards and I've pretty much found life really difficult. Uh, like I said before, the personal independence payments, it, it takes away your identity, it takes away your independence and it's taking away a lot of my income because I'm unable to work right now. If it wasn't for this channel and people that are, are giving me donations through PayPal and um, Patreon, I really don't know how I would have survived and, and really got on this year. It's been a really tough, tough year and I, I just can't thank all my subscribers enough for the love and support you've all been giving me. Uh, but this means that my circumstances have changed. Uh, I've not been able to get around the house. Obviously, I've not been able to get in the garden and see Grandad and I've pretty much been uh, housebound. And my parents are now uh, caring for me and friends are now helping me get to and from hospitals. And the best thing, or well, I mean that in a most sarcastic term, is that the NHS cuts are now meaning that a lot of my departments locally for my hospital have closed down. So I now need to go backwards and forwards from London quite a few times in a month. And like I said in my previous video, it cost me £140 uh, just in uh, transfer fees and, and train tickets, etc. Just to get forwards and backwards from, uh, from my doctors. Now because I get this standard rate, I am allowed to claim that money back, but again it's another form, it's another process, and that can take up to three months, so now I'm living on £22 whatever a, a week, there's no way I can do this. So that's why I've not been around quite uh, so much this year, it's been a really tough year, but my circumstances have changed, so I now have to reapply for the carers component. So now we have to reapply and we've got the 40 page questionnaire. Again, it seems slightly different this time. There's a few different questions in there that make even less sense than before. And here's how I do it. So as my situation's changed, I've now got to go for the carers component. Um, so you get the dreaded brown letter again, and that means you've got to fill out the 40 page booklet of uh, how your disability affects you. And um, because I've got dyslexia, I'm going to have to get my mum to help me out. So, whichever one it is. Is it a big one? Mm -hmm. They do give you a paid envelope, which is nice. you just got to put it back in there and send it off to the DWP once you've filled out the 40 page booklet. So, we'll do this again. Do you need help from another person to prepare or cook a simple meal? So we go straight down to that one. What are the options? Do they mind or motivate you to cook? Do they plan the task for you? Do they supervise you? Do they physically help you? Do they prepare all your food for you? Well, it's the last one, but you've only got a yes. This includes help you have and help you need but don't get. Yes, no, or sometimes. So why, is there, why is there not a tick box between each one? So. I think if we just tick the one that we think... We just say yes? Mm -hmm. If you click it, if you just tick yes, are they going to know which one out of the five options it was? So I think we tick the by the side of it. This is ridiculous. Yep. I guess so. That one. And that one. Yeah. Thanks. 
son. If you'd like to keep up to date on all of my future releases, click the subscribe button here. Here are some links to some of my other videos. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.